Okay, let's get going. I have um, my colleague, Dr. Francisco Aberhoff from the Division of Viral Hepatitis. Um, start off the um, session today with an overview of the global gaps in HCV diagnostics. Francisco. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, so again, uh, my talk, I'm going to focus it really speaking about um, issues in lower and middle income countries. And um, my task is to sort of examine an overview of the gaps in diagnostics. Um, as John alluded to earlier, I'll remind you that, again, CDC uh, actually was the first WHO collaborating center for uh, viral hepatitis, uh, including a special focus as a reference laboratory, and we are very active in this regard. So I want to kind of frame this uh, presentation in the context of the, uh, the global health uh, sector strategy. Um, as you may know, in May of this year, uh, the World Health Assembly adopted a strategy for HIV, uh, hepatitis um, and TB, and for the first time, hepatitis was named in that. And the hepatitis has these sort of goals and targets, and I'm not going to go through in detail on them, but I do want to focus on these two are the two main ones that uh, really impact, I think, and uh, uh, intersect with uh, diagnostics. So the first one is uh, the strategic direction one, information for focus and accountability, which again, to, to us, it's more like surveillance. We could think of it acute surveillance, chronic surveillance, morbidity and mortality. And I wanna give you some examples of, uh, of how these come into play, in, in, mostly in the countries that we're working with now. So first, uh, I wanna just show you um, some, some data from Pakistan. Um, we've been involved with a sentinel surveillance for viral hepatitis, for acute hepatitis in Pakistan uh, since 2010. Uh, by the way, very few countries uh, in, in lower middle income countries have such uh, surveillance. So they do have a laboratory testing algorithm, which we've had um, uh, uh, trying to improve, if you will, but basically they stop at anti-HIV, uh, anti-HCV, um, and they don't have RNA testing or uh, confirmatory testing uh, presently. And we're working with them to try to get that um, uh, implemented, but it it's, uh, continues to be a challenge. Um, over the last five years, six years, um, the, the, five lab, the five hospitals that have acute surveillance, and it, there's, there's specific case definitions uh, beyond laboratory as well, uh, they've identified uh, 10,000 suspect cases of interest. They've only lab confirmed uh, 4,300 of those, so 40%, so 60% were unconfirmed of the acute hepatitis. Of those, HCV was the overwhelming um, um, uh, positive um, um, virus that was identified from those cases. Um, we did um, our lab with, with Salim actually leading with, a, uh, with a, uh, an intern he had, uh, did send them some panels for quality assurance. And this is the uh, HCV panels, and you can see that most of them, four of the hosp four of these hosp three, of the, three of these four hospitals that, that did this had pretty good results, but one of them did have, if you notice, three of the positives were negative. And actually, uh, when I looked at them, I reviewed them this last week, this was done in 2014, HCV was the best. It was much worse for the other viruses. So really, issues of lab quality are definitely um, continuing to plague uh, Pakistan. Um, in India, we've been asked to work with them uh, as well. They have uh, a number, they actually have an acute surveillance system as well and have identified um, every year approximately 100 um, outbreaks in the country. And you can see it varies by state and there are whole issues around surveillance. This is some of the lab testing and what I, you know, kind of, this is from 2011 to 2013. You can see that they identify over 200,000, 200 to 300,000 acute cases of hepatitis. They only test for A&E because these are epidemic prone. But you can see that uh, in year 2013, over 200,000 were tested for hepatitis A and probably 20 or 30,000 were positive. So there's we think a lot of issues with laboratory testing going on as well here, and they don't even test for C. Unless there's a specific cluster, then they might go ahead and do an investigation and test for C. I think you're all aware of the, the global prevalence of hepatitis C is, is estimated variably from 240,000 to maybe 150,000, depending on, on, um, on what, what data you're looking at. Um, 
And this is, uh, the, the basis for this was uh, data that was um, actual data, okay? So just sort of going back, you can see they've got nice um, prevalence data throughout the world, but when you actually look at the data, it's actually quite sparse, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, very few uh, data elements to make these national um, recommendations, or these national uh, estimates or international estimates, I should say, sorry. Um, so uh, another, another um, along that same line of zero prevalence, we've been, as some of you may know, we've been working in the country of Georgia, uh, working on an elimination program, and one of the key uh, activities is defining the disease burden. So we were involved in a zero survey in 2015, uh, which identified um, an anti-HCV prevalence nationally, these are crude data, of 7.5% and RNA positive of 5.3, so overall the country with about um, um, uh, you know, one in 20 people being infected with HCV. There were some marked differences by age and gender. You can see that uh, the males have a, uh, a much higher prevalence than females, particularly 40 to 49. It turns out this coincides with the breakup of the Soviet Union and there's somewhat of a civil war in the country. And so uh, when you hear a little bit of the history behind it, it's sort of uh, all the uh, Georgians do understand why the prevalence is this way. Um, as I mentioned, it's an elimination program, and they're using these data um, to actually help them guide their activities, their, um, their elimination program, and part of the, a big part of that is treatment. So this is looking at estimated, uh, the, the yellow line is the estimated number of RNA positive or, or uh, actually infected by city, and these data have actually been very helpful to the Georgians in developing their national plan. Another part of the global health strategy is, again, uh, prevention of hepatitis C. Um, and again, you could look at blood safety, infection control, harm reduction, perinatal transmission, as was mentioned, are all modes, potential modes of transmission. Uh, I want to just turn attention to uh, uh, blood safety. In 2013, there was a uh, study published that looked at, and, and by the way, as you all know, in Sub-Saharan, or many of you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, HIV programs are are heavily supported through the Global Fund and through PEPFAR, and blood safety is a, a major part of that. So this evaluation looked at 51 blood transfusion centers in 17 countries, and just at the bottom you see they did for HIV, HCV, and HBV, but the results showed an 80% sensitivity uh, for, um, for the panels, again, suggesting that one out of four, up to one out of, one, sorry, one out of five, um, uh, HCV infected units are probably getting transfused, so we have some work to do, and, and this is in a place that are pretty heavily supported by PEPFAR and Global Fund. So again, just looking at some of the challenges we have globally. Um, then uh, we've been talking a lot about screening and linkage to care, so um, this, this is the, another one of the strategic directions, the interventions for impact that I want to talk about. Um, and again, going back to Pakistan, they, have also, they do have a high prevalence of, of HCV, and they've had uh, national and provincial treatment programs for several years. We were asked to do a program review and collaborate on a program review in Sindh province, um, which is where Karachi is in 2014. Part of that assessment was looking, uh, we sampled uh, hospitals where they do treatment. By the way, they do have subsidized treatment in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, it's interferon-based, uh, but um, they do treat a, a large number of patients throughout the country. So these were uh, PCR uh, data from the sites that we looked at, looking at 2012 and 2013 data. And you can see that uh, PCR in 2012, in the first year, only you know, about 50% were actually had a PCR prior to treatment. During treatment, there were none. Uh, it dropped down dramatically to end of treatment and no SVRs. So even with, and this is not even speaking to the quality of the tests. I showed you uh, that there may be issues there, but uh, just in terms of even doing tests and availability, there are, are major gaps still. Again, going back to Georgia, uh, one of the, the, the other strategies was improving treatment access. And in, in the first year of their program, they actually did a lot of screening. They're including blood donors, which we don't really... Uh, think about as, as, as a screening program, but they did include their 75,000 donors. So over 170,000 people were tested and approximately 19% were HCV positive. But actually we know very little about their test quality and were they linked to care. Um, so we do have some work uh, going on in the country that's um, actually looking at assessing their screening program. 
Um, and with their, with their um, I was actually there last month, we discussed their national test kit procurement policy. And their, their regulations are that without WHO prequalification, they must purchase the cheapest test by law, I guess, based on data that the manufacturers provide, simply on that data, not on ind independent testing. And there's no method to ensure high quality tests are purchased. So again, as I mentioned, we are working with the country to develop a QA system. They have uh, lots of uh, treatment monitoring in Georgia. I won't go into this, but um, we do need, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the whole idea of simplifying testing is very important. Um, this is just to show that in, in Georgia, again, um, using different data, different data sources, we can actually put together a care and treatment cascade from the zero survey data. We know how many were infected, how many know their status. We ask those questions. And from their national treatment database, how many enrolled and actually get cured. So it's, it's um, again, and laboratory data is critical for all of this, of course. Um, I just want to quickly touch base on some work we've uh, collaborated on with the World Health Organization, the Western Pacific Regional Office, um, and talk about um, uh, laboratory networks. WHO has laboratory networks for poliomyelitis, measles, Japanese encephalitis, rotavirus, and others. And again, these are critical for, um, for um, elimination programs. Um, in the red, you see uh, the, different the different places in, Austra in uh, the Western Pacific that have either reference labs or national labs or subnational labs. And you see in red at the far right um, is the hepatitis B, not even hepatitis C. And there's currently only one lab in Australia. Um, so again, I think this concept of national um, of laboratory networks would be important when you're considering sort of strengthening the need to strengthen overall capacity in these lower and middle income countries. Um, again, yeah, I think you all are aware of the importance of regional lab networks. So I just want to go into my summary now. So basically, um, the WHO uh, Global Health Sector Strategy does rely heavily on high-quality laboratory data for their surveillance, care, and treatment prevention. Uh, there are major data gap, major HCV data gaps to assess national and global prevalence. Um, there's limited acute surveillance being conducted, and uh, in those places, laboratory quality uh, is an issue. And there's also, uh, there is a need to always remember to test for all forms of viral hepatitis. Blood safety remains weak in many countries, uh, even sub-Saharan Africa, where there's uh, a lot of investment in it. There are major issues, as I mentioned, with laboratory quality, uh, and, le and networks would be um, an important aspect. So I think I'll just stop there. Um, thank you. Francisco, just uh, yeah. yeah, take a seat up here, please. <laughs> yes, are there any are there any questions? Yeah, one or two burning, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, burning questions. Uh, please raise your hand or go to the microphone. For Francisco, you touched on a number of gaps, which I think we'll get uh, um, more elucidation of in the in the follow up talk. So why don't we go on over and um, ask uh, Claudia? to come to the um, um, podium and uh, talk about efforts to improve and make diagnostics affordable globally. Claudio. Thank you, John. And sorry for the delay coming. Sure. One can get carried away talking about hepatitis. <laughs> so I was tasked to talk about our work on overcoming the bottleneck of uh, diagnostic test of affordability and accuracy for on a global market. Before I do that, I actually wanted to briefly say something about FIND, uh, because I think few of you will be familiar with FIND. Uh, FIND is a non-for-profit, non-governmental organization with a seat in Geneva. We are WHO collaborating center, and we are really focusing on developing and trialing implementing diagnostic tests that meet the needs in low, mid low and middle income countries um, to, to really um, overcome barriers there and, and transform lives. And we do those, that primarily in partnership with academic partners, industry partners, so we do not develop ourselves. We are more like a catalyzer, I would say, in trying to bridge uh, the science and get the, the appropriate tests to the patients in the countries in need. And our work for hepat on hepatitis is uh, more recent. We have 
done a lot of work on tuberculosis, malaria, NTDs, and some of you might know us uh, for our work on the expert MTB RIF uh, in tuberculosis. Our focus on hepatitis is very, very closely aligned with that of the WHO that Francisco already mentioned. It's really to enable an affordable and fit-for-purpose diagnosis, enable access to those diagnoses in low- and middle-income countries. And why is that necessary? I think um, it was already alluded to in earlier talks. Uh, there are a lot of patients with, H with hepatitis C, and about 75% live actually in low- and middle-income countries. How many know of their status? We heard in the U.S. It's, uh, it's less than 50%. Globally, it's less than 1%. And even fewer of those are obviously on treatment. And the countries are seeing this. They are seeing that as they are controlling the HIV better, or in, in Asia in particular, already in particular uh, populations, such as the uh, PWID, that they have a huge problem and that it uh, affects their, their uh, health systems and the health of their people tremendously. So what do we think, what do we want to do? We think that really HCV diagnostics can be transformed and to be, to become available for everybody. And on the top here, you see the current diagnostics continuum and it is complex. And some of the markers we can, uh, we can, uh, cross out right away thinking that we have uh, novel directly acting agents. Uh, also, it was mentioned earlier, I think we can get rid of uh, genotypic testing with pan-genotypic um, reagents. And even if we uh, have to accept that some of the genotype 3 patients will have a lower cure rate than on a, on a, public, health, uh, a public health approach would support that. Because if you get more patients diagnosed and onto treatment, it makes sense to do that. And if you can do that only with a simplified algorithm in these low and middle income countries, then that's what we need to do. Ideally, and that's my, my optimistic world, is we would also get rid of fibrosis staging at some point. Um, these drugs can be produced, we know, at less than $200 um, a course. So hopefully we'll get to that at some point. Treatment monitoring, the data shows more and more that there is questionable uh, importance of that. And it might change as there is resistance development. We don't know, but... I think it might be a, a consideration, a bold um, public health uh, consideration to also drop treatment monitoring completely and then just do a test of cure um, at the end of uh, therapy, a few weeks out of therapy. So this below here is like the simplified algorithm. And then let's take this a step fur further. Do we really need like this two-step uh, diagnostic strategy, meaning the serological test followed by a confirmatory NAT or core antigen test? This is what we are doing currently, and we have to do it because we, ha we have uh, tests that are not affordable enough. They are too high cost a piece to, to really go to a one-step diagnostic strategy. And also, like, this would only make sense in really high prevalence settings. But if we look, for example, in the, in the epidemic in, 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 um, in Asia, like, in PWID populations, there is prevalences of 60 to 70 percent. And then with a simple back of the envelope calculation, you can actually see that a test for five dollars uh, would actually make a one test strategy affordable. And I talked over lunch with some of the CDC colleagues here, and, and that might also make sense even in some settings in the United States. But the critical is that you have to have a low cost, affordable, and obviously well performing test. So this is what we have in mind, and um, this is, looks at the needs across the healthcare systems uh, in the low and middle income countries. So the needs really span from the community health worker, from the person who has the first contact with a, with a patient to the reference center. We have uh, serological tests um, of variable quality and variable affordability um, where there could be uh, substantial improvements. We have very good uh, tests for reference laboratories. We heard from the Mayo Clinic earlier um, and saw the, the nice pictures of these huge machines. What we are lacking is like for the the, the point of care, near patient testing uh, for the health posts, the clinics, the district level hospitals. And this is what also the WHO um, in, in collaboration with, um, with uh, many other, also here in this room, um, identified uh, to 
as, a, as the primary need and a target product pro profile was developed for this. Um, to, to look at point-of-care diagnostic tests um, on a molecular or core antigen basis and uh, what should those tests really look like. So at FIND, we have adopted uh, this uh, approach and has said, okay, let's focus our work on uh, hep C uh, POC tests, and we are taking a three-pronged approach. I would say a two-and-a-half-pronged approach. But... Um, First of all, molecular tests. There we have really low technical risk. We think that it's feasible to make um, a molecular test from capillary blood with high sensitivity and specificity. Um, the problem is the cost of those tests will, will probably not go below $10. I mean, this is the cost of goods of these integrated molecular tests, such as like the Cephate expert test for tuberculosis. Um, the current Cephate HCV test is at a price at $16. Um, so to get really to $10 would already be an achievement there. There's also problems with stability of reagents. Um, and so, so, but the main problem is really the cost. Core antigen test. Abbott has a marvelous platform, the Abbott Architect. But again, it's like huge. It is not a point of care test. But um, there also, we think that it would be feasible to actually transform that in a, in a, a point of care test, like a, an espresso type machine, ideally that runs off battery. Um, and it, we think it would be feasible at a lower cost of goods at any molecular test. Um, problem is that there are really technical uh, cha challenges, and uh, it is uh, that, that one needs sample processing, one needs signal amplification most likely, but, um, and such a test, simply because it's likely not going to reach the sensitivity of a molecular test, also would probably only be implemented in low- and middle-income countries, because in the developed world market, it's hard to argue for uh, maybe 5% less sensitivity, uh, even if the test is half the cost. And then the, the last here, just to mention briefly, we also are considering a dual antibody antigen test uh, with the thought that if the antigen posit is positive, you could actually proceed uh, with uh, treatment without further confirmation. But this is also technically very challenging because the sensitivity requirements um, are, are um, difficult to achieve. So the target product profile that I mentioned earlier, these are just the key characteristics here. Here, clinical sensitivity, analytics, sensitivity, and I highlighted the ones that I consider crucial. Um, so the, it's defined that the test should be ideally less than 200 IU per ml in terms of analytical sensitivity, minimally 1,000 to 3,000. This is what the Abbott Architect core antigen currently achieves, and ideally it should be less than $5. Um, where, does, where do these um, analytical cutoffs come from? It comes from... Uh, established data on what we think is the population distribution um, of RNA at the time of diagnosis, but we heard from Susan earlier that there's ongoing work to really substantiate this more because the published data is very limited. But it is likely that at, if you have a test that detects more than 10,000 IU per ml, you get to a clinical sensitivity of about 95%. So do, how do we go about our work? Like first, the TPP is defined in the consensus process. Then we look at all of the diagnostic developers out there. We define the opportunity and, and uh, build the partnership. And this is a very rigorous process that we follow through that's also externally validated by a scientific advisory board. Um, and, and then we proceed with the work. We get the funding and, and uh, work on the, on the development. And, with the partners, and um, and there we primarily provide the knowledge support. We provide um, um, the the funding, the the clinical samples, validation panels. Once there is a product that fits the TPP, we um, take it into clinical trials. We have a very large clinical trial network, and once there is approval and endorsement from the WHO, then we work with countries to actually implement this. And across all of these, in parallel, we also work on pricing. This we do in partnership with uh, Global Fund, for example, and other lead partners. Um, 
So just quickly, I know I'm short of time, but uh, just quickly, where do we stand? So for a molecular test, um, we, this is what we, I think we will be able to achieve. So this is a molecular test from capillary blood um, that will be able to achieve an analytical sensitivity of around 200. Problem is the price per test is hard to drive down. And there we have already identified one developer. It's an obvious choice, it's Cepheid. Um, and there we are working to develop this capillary blood test. But we don't want to m create a market monopoly. Um, and we are working with to identify another developer. They are all not as far along as Cepheid. Um, and they will be uh, identified and supported with a hopefully clinical evaluation uh, by 2019. For core antigen, this is a little earlier, um, but there we think we can achieve 3,000 IU per ml on capillary blood, and here we think it would be possible to achieve a price at least of 5 to $7. Dollars. Here it is important to have all of the key reagents, the antibodies, um, and there also we have done an extensive landscape analysis and are going into feasibility studies towards the end of the year. And uh, with that, given the advanced time, I'll, I'll finish. And I hope I gave you a brief overview of our, our work and where we stand and wanted to thank the people who supported me in this. And I also wanted to say that I'm very sad to actually say that I'm going to leave, um, the, I'm going to drop the, the head of hepatitis. I'm, uh, I came to find as the head of tuberculosis and, and built the hepatitis program. I've developed a lot of passion into that, but I also have realized that it is too big and too much work to take, take on. So now uh, FIND is getting a new head of hepatitis and HIV as of next month, and it's Francesco Malinucci, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, but you will see more of him in the future. Thank you, and thank you for your work in standing up the hepatitis unit uh, in fine. Uh, any questions for Claudia? Yes, Ray. Just curious that, um, I mean, the, the low cost diagnostic test is you know, fantastic, but your commercial partner must have done the, the, the math mm -hmm. uh, to make a business case. I mean, is, do, you know, do you know if they did that and it makes sense? I mean, it sounds too cheap for them to uh, make any kind of profit? I think it's an excellent question. I mean, the, the benefit of a low and middle income country market is that you have large volumes. So while your margins might be smaller, um, you actually can still make benefit profit. And I think uh, Cepheid is a good example for that. I mean, while um, for their TB essay, they are not making a lot of profit. Actually, also like the development of the platform, the portfolio that they have really has positioned them uh, and has allowed them to grow in a way uh, that's, that probably wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And this is primarily um, or like the TB essay that they have developed at a low cost is a, is a big contribution there. Um, and yes, you know, we are not asking developers to sell under their cost of goods. I think it's only a viable solution if, if the industry partners are making profit, um, but at the same time the test needs to be affordable, but that margin might be smaller. Yeah. yeah question uh, over here on the left. <coughs> Um, my name is Mustafa, and uh, I'm from Egypt, and you know the whole world knows about our problem. And I had been working with hepatitis for years and years, and also I, you know, spent a long time doing some, let's say, development work, the kind of work you've been talking about. And based on such kind of experience and being exposed to the hepatitis world, I think we should, or it will be better if we focus more and more on the antigen detection assays. This is a very rich area to work on. Antigen detection assays can be <coughs> transformed to BOC format, can be sent to the other parts of the world. Also, it will work with you on the real concentration of the virus in the sample. Whenever there is a virus, there is a strong 
antigen signal. When there is no virus, there is no signal. It will also be more stable than the molecular testing. Molecular testing is, you know, technically demanding, very expensive, and also <clears throat> subject to uh, uh, subject to contamination. It's very easy to get a false results with mm -hmm. molecular testing. Thus, I, you know, just you know, uh, suggesting just to focus more and more on the antigen detection assays. So it mm -hmm. could be a very good potential to the entire world just to be able to control and eradicate this deadly disease. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, yeah. So, I mean, that was our thinking as well. But I think, like, molecular test for us is low, low risk, high probability of success. Core antigen test development is very high risk because it's really that the sample processing and the expert in the field is sitting in row two here from Abbott. <laughs> uh, the antigen, the processing necessary and uh, the steps necessary to put that into a point of care test is not easy. And it's not the same for, for as for HIV or um, other antigen-based assays. So it's really, it's really complex. And we'll see if we are successful. I think if we are, then super. Yeah, I can, just, I can just make a brief comment that, that what Claudia means is that for a sample that you want to detect antigen in, in a seropositive person, you need to destroy all the antibodies and you need to disrupt the virus and present it to the, you know, to the assay so that you can capture the antigen and then tag it on the other side. So it, it took quite a bit of uh, figuring out. It was actually done by our colleagues in Abbott Japan, really uh, worked on that and uh, mm -hmm. developed the test. But it, but it is a, a, a high hurdle. And the test came on the market in 2008 or 9. I think it's probably still the most sensitive test out there. And, uh, you know, we, we, we like the test. It has a lot of technical issues and problems uh, that I won't discuss right now. But, but it's a very difficult test, very sensitive. You know, we figured a way to make this really sensitive. And uh, it, it works pretty well. Yeah. And, and as Claudia said, it, it, its endpoint is around, and I'm going to talk tomorrow morning, but, you know, about... 2,500 to 3,000 IU per mil, you know, viral load of 2,500 to 3,000 IU per mil. And it detects probably 92 to 95 percent of uh, RNA positive people in, in the composite studies. And if we were studies. to achieve that, that would be wonderful. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. We just need to make it from here to like here. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, the, the key to all these uh, projects is really the word sustainability. I mean, as long as there's funding from some large organization, whether it's a company or a, a government or something, uh, the, the work goes along and uh, things can get, tests can get introduced into a country. But as soon as that external funding disappears, <laughs> then everything stops. And so uh, assuming that you will be successful in developing the low cost test with the appropriate specificity and sensitivity, the question then becomes once FIND leaves, once all the uh, supporters of the project leave, then how does the program uh, continue? Because that's really the key to the whole thing. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Definitely. I mean, I think like it's on the one hand to de develop the diagnostic test that actually fits the needs locally, that is affordable, but then actually tra translating it into uptake in countries and in sustainable uptake is another challenge. Um, I think, yeah, we have seen successes in that. We have seen successes in tuberculosis, in HIV, in, in African sleeping sickness. Um, but it requires a lot of work and it requires a lot of thinking. And I think for FIND, uh, we um, are going to work um, in seven countries, um, primarily Asian countries, to implement uh, diagnostic tests. First of all, to strengthen the infrastructure um, within current HIV programs and with currently available tests, but then to also introduce new tests as they become available. Um, and the thinking is that within HIV uh, programs, you can actually leverage a lot of investment in already. You can also use uh, polyvalent platforms and, and all of that. But yes, yeah, sustainability is, uh, I think, sine qua non um, that you have to have in mind from the start and how you hand it over. I mean, we are doing this in partnership with ministries of health. 
so that that there is a sustainable component or there is at least a, the, the buy-in from the from the national programs to go forward. And Georgia is actually one of the countries that we are focusing as well. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you Good. very much, Claudia. Good. Good. Uh, thank you. Then I'm also tasked to actually introduce the next speaker, and she's a former colleague of mine from the Beth Israel Deaconess, a wonderful infectious disease expert, HIV, Hep C expert, and assistant professor in, in Boston, Kemi. Thank you. Oh, sure. I'm excited to be here while we get the talk up. Is your laser so, pointer if you'd like it. Oh, great. Um, mine's going to be a little bit more of like a thought exercise. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, the fact that just because you can do something, um, is it really actually necessary? I think in many um, aspects of lab medicine, we pay for more than we actually need or use. And the example I have is um, I need a new car, or my family says I need a new car. I don't actually believe that, but um, I'm being forced to go out and, and look at different cars. So I could look at a car that goes 160 miles an hour. Um, there are cars out there that have that feature. I will never, ever, ever in my life go 160 miles an hour. And so if I pay that extra money for a feature that I will never use, that's fine if I have lots of money to, 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 to spend, but no, I don't. And so I want to pay for the features I actually need. And so keep that car analogy or whatever other product, you know, that has a wide spectrum of features, you know, and how do you think about the ones you're actually going to use? A lot of the examples I'm going to give today are from my hospital to show at a wealthy hospital in Massachusetts, you know, in Boston. There's all sorts of stuff we can do. What are we actually using? All right, these are my disclosures. I've helped find, they're awesome. <laughs> so when we think about um, diagnostics, it's really important, especially if you're a diagnostics company, to understand what it is you're trying to diagnose. Because I think a lot of these things end up getting conflated or you, you create the technical capacity for like the most refined thing and, and it ends up being far, far more than you need for most other circumstances. So it's very different if you're looking at how are you gonna screen a general population versus how are you gonna screen a high risk population for acute hepatitis C, which is very different than screening the blood supply. Um, and so just understanding what's the actual problem you're trying to solve with your diagnostic. Um, and then the other thing is rarely do we have one test in isolation. Usually we have tests either working in concert with each other or within the context of some clinical scenario. And really, again, understanding what is that? How are all the pieces of information going to work? Um, because if you're just looking at that one diagnostic in isolation, you're probably going to be overpaying for features because you're asking it to do something that actually its context might help out with. Um, as Claudia mentioned that I think performance for fit or form for fit or something, I call it right test for right level of care. Um, a lot of countries have um, kind of a mandate to purchase the least expensive test possible. They typically are looking at just one, you know, sort of a single dimension of information, not thinking if you spend less now, do you end up actually spending much more over time? And that can really be a problem. So I'm going to um, show you um, a couple of different examples. Um, oh, this is actually an older slide of mine. Um, oh, that's going to be exciting. Um, so um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And one of them that I'm going to start with is from our hospital at Beth Israel Deaconess. And I want to point out um, Dr. Ann Din here from, um, uh, from pathology is the one who actually did all of this work. So if you have any questions about this part, um, she's going to be the one that's going to answer. So our challenge was we were doing baby boomer testing. We've done it for a couple of years. Uh, we've tested 56,000 people uh, through this baby boomer testing program. And that leads to about 13 1,500 tests a month at this point, I, and about 50 of them end up being antibody positive, you know, month after month. And 
at, the, at, at this moment, what we found is about 15% of our antibody positive samples don't get an RNA test. Now, that's pretty good compared to national averages, but it's still not 100%. It's not acceptable. So how do we create reflex testing? You've heard from the large labs. Um, they have the volume and the capacity. They're able to store a lot of samples. But for, you know, sort of a smaller hospital-based lab, storing, you know, 1,000 1,300 samples for the 50 that you might need to go back and retrieve um, to, to do, or um, as, as Leslie was talking about this morning, doing a two-tube sample, drawing two tubes from 100 and, you know, 1,300 people in order to, you know, pull out that one tube for the 50 people um, is, is just, it's just, it's too much resources. It's not actually feasible. And um, so we looked at the algorithm and, you know, and I'm just going to show you, as you all know, the current algorithm algorithm is pretty complicated. There's lots of processing, um, lots of storage requirements, lots of different tubes, lots of patients coming back. You've already heard this. What if we can just use one tube? Um, and so what um, we did was actually look at could you um, vary the, um, the conditions that the tubes are under um, and I'm going to show you this one. Um, can you vary the conditions that the tube is under? So it's drawn, it's at room temperature for a while, and then it's in the refrigerator. You've got enough capacity to refrigerate samples for a while, um, up to 96 hours. What happens to actually checking that viral load um, in that tube under those different conditions? And as you can see, we have a very good correlation between these um, HCV RNA samples that were taken under these very conditions versus standard draw a separate tube, immediately spin and process and freeze it, you know, and then, and, and, and then do the um, RNA test. The, the trend, if you look at um, sort of the standard methodology versus um, the sort of sustained storage, you do see a little bit of a lower viral load. And so what we had to decide is, is that good enough? Um, is it okay to have maybe up to about 0 0.3, 0 0.5 log lower viral load? And so this, this method is only going to be used in people who've had an antibody test and are now reflexing to the RNA. If somebody has been diagnosed and now I send a separate RNA sample because I want to figure out if they qualify for Harvoni, for example, um, I really want to know what their viral load is, this particular method won't be used. The standard method will be used. Um, and uh, and I'm, in an interest of time, I'm not going to go over this, but um, uh, we did not have a problem with carryover either. And for the folks that have very, very low viral loads, we're going to note that they need to actually bring that person back for a new sample. So. I can get viral loads whenever I want in my patients, but how am I actually using them? So I'm going to tell you about two patients that I actually saw relatively um, close in time. Uh, one was a woman with HIV. She has multiple myeloma in, in recent remission. She's on uh, hemodialysis because of end-stage renal disease, probably has cirrhosis. She actually has porphyria cutanea tarde, so we really needed to start her on treatment immediately. Her viral load is 99 million. And she got started on grazapavir and elbosphere for 12 weeks. Around the same time, I saw a young woman, she's in her 20s, um, considering pregnancy at some point in the future. Uh, her baseline viral load was 6,700. She got started on grazapavir, elbosphere for 12 weeks. Uh, the woman with the very, very high viral load, 99 billion, took a little bit longer to come down, uh, but by week four, she was uh, completely undetectable. Um, the, the young woman uh, with the very low viral load was, as, as you might expect, undetectable at week two. Um, but the point of this is they both got the exact same management. Whether they were 99 million or 6,000 did not matter to how I managed those patients. Here's another example. Uh, one man has HIV, he's got cardiovascular disease, he has cirrhosis. Um, viral load around 3 million. He got started on semeprevir, sofosavir for 12 weeks. Um, by week two, he was less than 15 target detected. By week four, less than 15 target not detected. Around the same time, saw another man. Um, he's in a group home, so I know he's taking all of his meds because I talked to the group home. They give him his meds every day. Multiple sclerosis, he has cirrhosis. Um, viral load about the same. Started on semeprevir, sofosavir for 12 weeks. 
Week two, 916. Week four, 91. Week six, target still detected. Week eight, finally target not detected. The first one relapsed. I had to retreat him with Harvoni with, and Ribavarin for 24 weeks, and he, he's now cured. Um, and the second one got cured. So how did those on-treatment viral loads help me? They did not change my management at all. Um, even the one time when we actually are supposed to use a viral load for clinical management, which is giving uh, cephosphoril lidipasphere for eight weeks versus 12 weeks, you theoretically can give it for eight weeks in people who are treatment naive, not cirrhotic, viral loads less than six million. The one time we would actually need a quantitative viral load. Even then, um, Dr. Freed, uh, who, who moderated this morning, uh, runs a, a big registry called Target, um, and they found that only 40% of people who would qualify for eight weeks actually got eight weeks. So even when we could use a viral load, we're not using the viral load. Um, this is looking at a bunch of different cohorts where um, they had data on viral loads prior to starting treatment and after this particular group of people relapsed to see what sensitivity would you need. And in this particular group of patients, 99.9% .9 would have been detected at baseline if you had a viral load caught off of at least 1,000 international units. Notably, you would have missed a handful of people um, at that week 12 SVR point. You might have not recognized that a small number of people um, had actually relapsed because it seems like those viral loads might have been a little bit lower. Um, I am really not going to go through this. This is what we do for genotype 3 in the United States. You're getting a genotype. You're getting sequencing to see if somebody has an NS5A uh, resistant variant. It changes your management. Um, and that is not going to happen in most of the world. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different um, uh, um, assays. This particular one is just how do you screen for antibody. Um, and I'm looking at two different um, 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 uh, assays. Uh, I actually took the sensitivity and specificity from the product labels, but I made up all the other circumstances in terms of price just for ease of calculation. The first test is an inexpensive test. Let's call it a dollar a strip. Um, and it looks like it has very good sensitivity and specificity. And if you had to test um, 10,000 people, um, the majority of your test costs are going to be from that HCV RNA test, not the antibody test. Um, the second one looks on the surface to have pretty similar sensitivity and specificity. A big difference, though, is you only miss five people. Five people are false negatives uh, with the second test that we're going to call it $10, um, compared to 21 that you missed with the first test. How much are we willing to spend to not miss people? And this is where you, you get in, you can do sort of cost kinds of analyses, but you also get into some judgment. Um, this is an algorithm that we are actually implementing in a test and treat protocol uh, that I'm working on with Dr. Uh, Saeed Hamid uh, in, in Pakistan at Aga Khan University. Um, and it's very much like the algorithm uh, that Claudia showed earlier, uh, where uh, we are not genotyping because 90% of Pakistan is genotype 3. Um, we are just doing a test to detect active infection. We're doing a FIB4 to decide um, the degree of, of fibrosis. Um, and that's because you do additional things for, for patient management when they have cirrhosis. Uh, we're going to make sure that the GFR is greater than 30 so you can get cefosbuvir and then test for cure at the end. Um, so just looking at how do you streamline this diagnostic algorithm absolutely as, as, as thinly as possible when you're starting to you know, magnify the scale of this project from not a couple of hundred people, but to tens to hundreds of thousands of people. Every penny you can shave off really makes a difference. Um, in, our particular, in this particular algorithm, everybody is getting 12 weeks of treatment for genotype 3. 
Um, and uh, what I struggle with um, is if we look at the US um, uh, IDSA ASLD guidelines, uh, they recommend that if you have genotype 3 and cirrhosis, that you get 24 weeks of cefosfovir and ribavirin, as opposed to just 12 weeks of, of diclatosphere and cefosfovir. Um, if you look at the actual total cost of two different strategies, one where everybody just gets 12 weeks versus another where cirrhotic patients actually get that longer course of treatment with ribavirin, the total costs are actually not that much more, probably, um, and you probably would cure more cirrhotic patients, uh, which are the ones that you most urgently want to cure now um, if you did that two-fold strategy where the cirrhotic patients got longer treatment. But that's also more complexity. So this is why doing pilot studies like this, really gathering real-time data to make sure that we're not harming people while we're trying to create the most efficient process possible is going to be really important. So any test and street strategy anywhere in the world, including the United States, is going to have trade-offs. And I think what we're hearing today is we need to combine lab data, real-world implementation data, and cost data to really determine those risks and benefits and somehow figure out how to factor in judgment and preferences across multiple stakeholders, um, including the patients themselves, to figure out how we're going to balance these different competing interests. That's it. Thank you, Kemi. Excellent talk. Uh, do we have a couple of questions? Burning questions, one or two, maybe? No? Kemi, maybe I have a question. I'm, sure. I totally agree with everything that you said. It was very much aligned with what I had said earlier. But how, on a personal level, actually, do you deal with the, the patient in front of you and the population uh, level approach that you are promoting here um, for, for implementation in a larger scale? Yeah, so I, um, I'm not going to be sitting down with that patient in Pakistan. And I think, you know, this is when you do global work, you know, really trying to understand, you know, sort of who that person is in that particular community, what their values are. Um, it's, it's going to be really important. Dr. Hamid is just a, a wonderful, sensitive doctor, and, you know, and he's going to be trying to figure this out. And I think all we can do is really look at how actually burdensome is just a straight 12-week protocol. And in the real world, do we have higher SVR rates or do we have lower SVR rates? And do we take one arm that actually introduces ribavirin? I mean, I've had people hospitalized because of ribavirin-associated toxicities. It's not a benign drug. You need to know that it's worth exposing people. And so, you know, if we realize, gosh, this, this you know, 12 week for everybody, we've got a lot of failures and now they've got resistance and we don't know what to do with it, you know, versus um, you know, we're going to add additional complexity up front, but overall it's going to cure more people, including more of the most urgent to cure people. Um, I, I, that's kind of what we're thinking about right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Then one more round of applause. <laughs> Then it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Lorac. Anne is an epidemiologist at the Epicentre in Paris of Médecins Sans Frontières. And Médecins Sans Frontières has been like really a front runner in implementing hepatitis C care in uh, developing world countries. And Anne will talk to the experience on that. Yes, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for um, inviting me to present the MSF activities in uh, hepatitis C. So MSF has started to implement uh, hepatitis C activities uh, since 2013 and 14, since uh, we hope that to have access to the new DAs. I will first present an overview of uh, our activity, but I will focus on the screening and diagnostic part. I will briefly also show you a little our activities in monitoring and treatment, and I will briefly finish by the operational research that are proposed in parallel or nested in the medical activities. Really, as 10 minutes is very short, I will really focus on screening. So due to common risk factors and medical interaction, MSF has started to implement hepatitis C care in the HIV cohorts 
in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and the different partners. These courts are mainly in Asia and in Africa. They are the one in blue on the map. We also propose hepatitis C screening to patients who use drugs, either within the HIV courts or in some specific projects, like, for example, in Iran. Our attention was drawn to other comorbidities as tuberculosis, and now the screening is systematic for TB and MDR-TB patients. This is mainly for projects in Eastern Europe, like Armenia or Georgia. Some specific programs are also implemented, as in Pakistan or in Cambodia, in primary health center or in Ministry of Health hospitals. The screening strategies have been adapted to the local context, to the current activities, and to the targeted populations. So they are very different from one site to another. Nevertheless, in the majority of the projects, the screening is done with a rapid diagnostic test. Then a quantitative viral load confirms the active infection. Considering the literature and the different evidence available on the performance of the test, for the moment MSF recommends recommends for its activities only one test, but we hope that the WHO pre-qualification for RDTs will enlarge the choice of quality ensured test. The access to viral load remains complicated and it's often uh, available only in the capital. Uh, It remains expensive and the quality controllers are not every time in place. This lack of access leads to an intermediate step in some of the countries. For example, in Pakistan, we do a qualitative test before to do the quantitative test. In other settings, we try to implement GenExpert, as sometimes it's already in place for our TB activities. So after more than one year of activities, we find really two different situations. In Africa, in the HIV cohorts, the reported proportion of positive serology and of viremic patients are very low. It's uh, around uh, 0.05 or 1%. The proportion of confirmed HIV displayed in the table is calculated taking the number of uh, positive viral load over the number of total screened patients. The screening strategies and the targeted population are different in the three cohorts, so we should be very careful to compare the different uh, groups. Um, especially in Mozambique, just to maybe to explain the higher, prevalent, uh, the higher proportion, the strategy um, focuses on uh, high risk uh, patients, especially, uh, especially sorry, the heavy drug user. Just to notice that uh, the proportion of uh, confirmed patients with a viral load are really different in the three sites, 20-30% in Kenya and uh, Uganda, and 86% in Mozambique. On contrary, in Asia and Middle East, the proportions are really higher concerning hepatitis C infection. The projects have also different screen population and have implemented different strategies. The proportion of the positive serology so vary from 8 to 33% in the different uh, sites. The sites, especially in north of Myanmar, in Kachin and Shan, uh, with 24 and 33%, show really high prevalence, and it's, it's also a site where we found a lot of IV drug users. Um, The same uh, than for African um, settings. The proportion of uh, confirmation by viral load are really different. 40% in Cambodia and 87% in in India or Myanmar. Different factors could influence the results, but for us, one of the key questions is really the performance of the test in these settings where the tests have not been evaluated. As mentioned in the overview, MSF has started also hepatitis C activities in other types of projects. We report a very high proportion of viremic patients in our project in Pakistan. This could be linked with the fact that it's one of the countries which is really affected uh, by uh, the hepatitis C epidemic, or also by the strategy of uh, tracing the relatives of the hepatitis C patients. So this 
different results for us highlight at first the fact that there is really a need of hepatitis C screening and of hepatitis C care in the different settings and considering also the different population. For us, the hepatitis C remains a silent disease because very few screening programs are implemented in these countries. Therefore, we need quickly to enlarge access if we want patients to be diagnosed. For us, the first emergency is really the lack of evidence, or at least of studies, concerning the performance of the screening test. Just before uh, this morning, we had the question about the HIV, the performance of the test in HIV uh, population, and if we don't miss a lot of patients, we in fact don't know because the tests are not evaluated in this different uh, population of uh, dif in this uh, HIV population, or also in other settings with other comorbidities could be endemic. Um, this performance of IRDTs impacts also the screening of uh, the blood transfusion. To give you an idea, in MSF, we do 75,000 screening of donors per year, and most of them are done in settings with the, where the platforms are not available. So we have to do them also by IRDTs. Secondly, I would like to emphasize the importance of process of quality control. Most, in, most of the time, it's not really available in the remote areas and in the different laboratories. For MSF, we try to implement a proficiency testing with a partner from France, but we face quite a lot of challenge to implement it. In addition to the quality, I think that it will join a little the presentation that was done, was, were done before. It's about simplification of the process and really to have access to simplify um, techniques like uh, the core antigen or viral load uh, point of care. We would like also to emphasize the fact that for us, the dry blood spot could be also a good way to facilitate access to viral load. So quickly, I would like to just to um, to present you a little the activity concerning the care about of uh, the hepatitis C patients that we diagnosed. So today we follow the WHO uh, recommendation, but we try to simplify as much as possible. One of the big barriers for us is that we face a lot of problem of access to the test at first, and then after access to the treatment. So usually we have to do a first prioritization using APRI or FIP4, and then after the patients that are the most in need will go to genotype and to fibroscan. And the genotype, unfortunately, is not available in all the countries, so we have to send them abroad. For the moment, in uh, the different settings, most of the genotype are the genotype one and three. In Uganda, we, face, we found also uh, the patients with genotype four. And in the Asian uh, sites, we have between eight and 35% of genotype six. We face also quite a lot of difficulties to identify this uh, genotype six. Fibroscan has been implemented in some sites, especially in HIV cohorts, as, as the biological markers are not validated for HIV patients. So for monitoring, we also follow the WHO recommendation, but we try to simplify as much as possible, keeping this balance between the surveillance, the safety, and uh, the access to the test. So we started uh, to treat uh, patients in five different uh, sites, and we use different regimens according to the genotype, but also according to the availability, or the av sorry, the availability of the drugs. For the moment, our results are quite good, but it's really a small number of patients, and I didn't also display in this table uh, the patients that were lost of follow-up or death during the follow-up. Those other programs are really ready, ready, sorry, to start, but really we face a delay due to the access to the drugs. So for us, really what is, will be important is to um, push the, the partners and, to, and, the, and the ministry to implement more policy, more guidelines. I'm a little short in time. So just briefly, MSF would like also to 
push and to use the 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 site where we are to uh, to promote uh, especially RDTs and to evaluate RDTs in co-affected patients or to see for other strategies of screening. I would like to thank all the different teams from the field and from the Ministry of Health on the field. And I would like to acknowledge also uh, UNITED who found uh, uh, part of the activities for co-affected patients. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anne, for this interesting overview. Any questions from the audience? Salim, please. Because the uh, viral loads, the quantitative viral load in this case, are really in the far or much more expensive. And so, due to logistical constraints, most of the time, we have to prioritize who will get the viral load, uh, the quantitative viral load. So, we do a first step with, with this qualitative test. It's more a logistical constraints and the fact that there is no access to this viral, viral load on site. I have actually two questions. Uh, one is a technical and one is a programmatic. First, a technical one. You've shown really, really low confirmation rates um, of your serology positive patients. And there have been publications on this uh, from Africa primarily. But it was uh, considered that it might have been the quality of the serological tests used there. You're using the Overshore test, which, I mean, is one of the few very highly uh, evaluated and uh, approved test. So do you still think that there might be some cross-reactivity or why do you think there is such low confirmation rates? Well, we don't have a lot of information. There are really very few studies about uh, these RDTs in, for example, African uh, mm -hmm. countries. So for us, what uh, we think is that, yes, there is cross-reactivity, especially for HIV patients. We know that we could have some uh, wrong results and also with hepatitis B or other uh, endemic diseases that are present in, uh, in, um, in these uh, settings. Mm. But it's really a good point and we would like to understand more and we think that we need to, to dig on this. Maybe Orosho can help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a, a quick question. I mean, you, um, the clinical sites you're describing, they're already very busy, I imagine, yeah. with a lot of other um, health issues d um, to be dealt with for the patient. And I was just wondering how, how is the incorporation or integration of hepatitis C testing and care being received by the workforce? It was, um, it's really dependent on the sitting, but it's true that we have only two sites who have, who, um, which uh, has only hepatitis C activities. All the other sites okay. otherwise have, has either HIV or TB care already to face. And in the same time, the, the, the team are already aware that the patient is an entity and that we have to consider him globally so that we need to, to treat all the different diseases that he could uh, uh, have. But it was, um, we had to add more human resources, either for, for counseling, either for care or for laboratory. But uh, yes, it was a, we tried to balance and to simplify as much as possible and to have really simplified tests, simplified guidelines to include it. And that relates to my last question, actually the programmatic question. Like MSF operates at sites that are typically outside of the Ministry of Health, the national programs. So, and it relates to what Cherry had asked earlier in terms of sustainability. Like how do you, uh, conceive like the sustainability of your hepatitis C programs in the long term? Do you imagine like transitioning over to the national programs? And is that a conversation that you start in the beginning as you set things up, or how do you do that? I saw that MSF is not known at all for uh, sustainability. And, uh, <laughs> but what we want to show is, in fact, it's really for us, is really to show that it's possible to integrate this care in the existing structure 
with a minimum uh, cost and a really a big eff efficiency. So really for us, we see more as a demonstration project to show and to advocate after to the Ministry of Health or other partners to implement also them uh, uh, in their uh, health uh, structures. So, and we started already since the beginning to include uh, the, our act, enfin, to, to discuss our activities with them, to, to involve them since the uh, yeah, from Thank start. you very much. And obviously, it's, it's really pioneer work. Thank you. Thanks. So, we'll take oh, one last question. Okay, Hi very there. quick. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, uh, Mike Reed from Orishore. So, I'm, I'm surprised and I guess a little concerned to hear that you believe you're having cross reactivity with um, HIV. Um, infected patients. We've, we've tested for that and not seen it, so I'd, I'd like to um, speak with you further about that and get a better understanding. So. Excellent. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Very good. Um, so we'll take a break of 10 minutes. If you could come back at 10 to 3, please. Yes. Thank you very much. And another round of applause for Anne. Thank you for coming yes. back. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce a fellow German. Um, Julia Kress from the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany, who is uh, working a lot with the WHO. And um, Julia is uh, presenting on the development of WHO standards for HCV NAT tests. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing team for inviting me. It's a great pleasure f for me to follow this invitation. Um, the topic today is um, the development of WHO international standards for HCV NIT tests. And I also will focus a bit on the standardization on HCV nets. So HCV nets play key role in the diagnosis and monitoring of treatment of hepatitis C, as they are the gold standard for detecting active HCV replication. Highly sensitive and standardized NAT assays are crucial for blood donor screening in terms of reduction of antibody negative window period, but also during antiviral therapy, viral load assessment at baseline is critical for determining response kinetics. The regulatory requirements for blood screening and treatment recommendations rely on common reference materials for example, the minimal HCV NIT sensitivity and threshold values are given in international units. Standardization of HCV net methods is indispensable for the harmonization of results. The basis, they are the basis of a common uniform reporting system for clinical laboratories, for blood banks, for regulatory authorities, and also for IVD manufacturers. They ensure the reliability, the traceability, and comparability of in vitro diagnostic HCV NIT methods. Standardization of HCV nets is also an essential requirement for CE marking of high risk IVD net assays according to the IVD directive and the common technical specifications in Europe. But they are also the basis for FDA approval of IVD nets in the US. The majority of commercial HCV nets is calibrated against primary reference materials of so-called higher order. Um, these are WHO international standards for HCV RNA for net assays. And their potency is defined by the international unit. And calibrated net assays report in international units. WHO reference materials represent biological materials of composition similar to actual clinical or blood donor samples. Their intended use is the validation and standardization of essential assay features, for example, the limit of detection. But also, a second uh, intended use is the calibration of secondary reference preparations assigned in international units. This could be regional, national, or um, in-house working standards, which are used as run controls in routine assays or for calibration of assays. On the next slide, I um, just want to show you the calibration hierarchy and metrological 
traceability to the WHO international standard. As you can see, um, the WHO international standard has the highest traceability followed by the secondary standards and the tertiary standards. The uncertainty of measurement changes by using secondary standard or tertiary standard material. On the next slide, I'm showing the history of the WHO international standard for HCV RNA. All in all, five uh, materials have been established. The first one was established in 1997. It was... Um, the, the very first international standard for NAT assays, and um, NIBSC in UK um, performed this is establishment. In the meantime, uh, four standards have been replaced. Now we um, have the, the fifth standard as the current one available at NIBSC in UK, and if you are interested, you can order this from their website. This current standard has been established in 2015, and it was made uh, from an HCV antibody negative plasma diluted in a pooled human negative plasma. It is HCV genotype 1A and has a unitage of 100,000 IU per vial. The um, establishment of WHO reference materials for NITs um, follows a uh, defined uh, procedure. And um, on the next two slides, I would like to show you how this is uh, performed. Um, at first, the need is identified by the scientific and medical community worldwide. Afterwards, a proposal is made to the WHO Expert Committee on Biological Standardization, the so-called so ECBS. And uh, afterwards, the priorization of projects is agreed by the WHO, the WHO collaborating centers, and also by the International Working Group on Standardization of Genomic Amplification Techniques. The establishment of a proposed WHO reference material is then decided at the ECBS annual meeting. Afterwards, the characterization, manufacture, and evaluation is performed on behalf of the WHO by one of the WHO collaborating centers. A defined standard procedure um, can be found in the WHO technical report series 932 in Annex 2. On the next slide, I would like to introduce the process. Um, at first, the candidate materials are selected and characterized. The feasibility studies um, are made. Afterwards, the material is, if needed, inactivated, for example, by heat inactivation. Then the preparation of a bulk material is done um, diluted into a specified matrix, then filling, freeze-drying, and labeling is done, followed by the characterization of the final product uh, in terms of potency, residual moisture, and oxygen content. Stability monitoring is implemented, and also commutability studies um, to uh, investigate, for example, matrix effects. Afterwards, an international collaborative study is performed and the data are analyzed um, by statisticians and the unitage is assigned in international units. A final report is sent to the WHO. These reports are normally available on the website of WHO if you are interested. And uh, afterwards, the official establishment is done by ECBS again. The storage and the distribution of the material is then located at the custodian laboratories. 
These could be the same as the collaborating centers, but sometimes the material is established at another site and then transferred to a custodian laboratory for storage and distribution. Um, on the next slide, I would like to show you a bit um, how you can use WHO standards for um, uh, standardization of assays. Here you can see um, the um, evaluation of a, a detection limit of two different NIT assays. Um, the WHO standard uh, was uh, used in a limiting dilution experiment, and you can see the LOD um, establishment in 95%, um, you have 21.3 IU per ml for the roche cobos Amplicor HCV test, and in contrast, for the in-house HCV nut method, you have 164.5 IU per ml. The 36% um, mark means that at that dilution step, you have one copy per sample in your uh, specimen. Um, on the next two slides, I just want to show you how sensitive assays are nowadays. I compiled um, the commercial quantitative and on the next slide the qualitative CE marked HCV nets, which are available on the market at the moment. And they are all calibrated against the WHO standard for HCV RNA. And as you can see, the assays are highly sensitive and um, have sensitivities of a 95% limit of detection, mostly lower than 15 or 10 IU per ml. <laughs> this is a slide for the qualitative assays. Okay, I think I'm at the end. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. Any questions from the audience? Salim, please. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is it possible to create a standard, like a multiplex standard for HDDFC, HIV together, and sort of have any separate standards for each of the markers? Or is it too technically challenging? Do, do you uh, mean um, a standard for HIV, HCV, HB yes. in one? At the moment, we do not have such standard, as far as I know, but maybe um, this would be a good um, yeah, proposal to WHO to evaluate. And, yes. and uh, any plans for creating a standard for HCV core antigen? For HCV co-antigen, as far as I know, there is something planned. Yes, it's... Also at Paul Ehrlich Institute, maybe. I, I have to ask the colleagues. It's in another section, so I, I'm not sure if, if, they are, um, if they do this at the moment, but yes, there so, are plans. And yeah. finally, you mentioned that mm -hmm. these standards, it's a biological material similar to serum or blood. So what is this material? This material is normally plasma, human plasma. Oh, it's human plasma. Yeah. But there's also cell culture material available if plasma is not. Okay. Thank you. I actually also have one question. Can you speak a little bit to how the WHO pre-qualification process actually uses the data that is generated from these standards? Um, they, as far as I know, they have different studies. They also use this WHO material but they perform additional studies for LOD and specificity and something like that. They have specified panels for that, yes. But it's a part of that evaluation that's done for the pre-qualification yes. yeah. of the WHO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn it over to Salim Kamili from uh, our, our division of viral hepatitis to talk about some of the efforts we are have underway to um, assist with um, 
evaluating the quality of diagnostics. Thank you, John. And as an organizer, I want to thank all of you for staying so late to the last presentation. I may add to listen to my presentation here. So uh, as we heard from the previous speakers in this session, they alluded to the challenges in diagnostics at the global level, which are primarily related to these issues here that are, li that are listed in on this slide. Number one being the performance of the test. We know there is a supply of unregulated diagnostic assays in these settings. Uh, the infrastructure, the lab infra infrastructure, which includes the equipment and, and uh, personnel also impacts the reliability of diagnostics. I'll show you some real world examples of how these issues affect the reliability of diagnostics in these resource poor countries. So uh, this is recently taken from a liver conference meeting in Mongolia. What they did, they did a limited evaluation of locally available HCV rapid tests, which are listed here. This evaluation is based on uh, about 300 samples, 68% of which were uh, anti-HCV negative. As you can see here, uh, the numbers here, they show that these assays here towards the end, they had significant number of false positives. And I plotted here on the top the cost of the assays. These assays are arranged in terms of cost. And you can see here the performance of the assay seems to be a direct function of the cost of the assay. The cheapest kit here was only 87% specific. And as Francisco mentioned earlier, uh, almost all countries in this region, they have a procurement policy that, that warrants them purchasing the lowest cost kit, regardless of the performance of the assay. So you can imagine what, how this is impacting, and as you can see here, this, these data illustrate the, the issue of the performance of the poor diagnostic assays and how they impact the diagnostics. In this example here, Francisco already revealed the country X, that's Pakistan here. So there were four labs in, in four sentinel sites. Uh, they all were provided the same diagnostic assays for hepatitis B screening and also for anti-HCV. We provided them a short panel for surface antigen, uh, 10 samples, six of them were HBSAG negative and four of them were positive. As you can see here, all four labs correctly tested the negative samples, but all four had false negatives, 100% false negative results. Now, for HCV, this panel uh, com was composed of equal number of positive and negatives, while as three labs had correct results, positive and negatives, one lab had 60% of false negatives. So what, what this tells us is that for hepatitis B, it most likely was the kit itself that was a poor sensitivity that because all four labs tested them negative. But for C, since three of the four labs had 100% accurate concordant results, clearly shows that this one particular lab had either issues with personnel competency or had issues with equipment, which could be the incubator, plate washer. Live folks here, they know very well what I'm talking about. So now countrywide, this was one of our large projects where we were trying to help this country with improving blood safety. This is based on test retesting of about 1,000 specimens. The country was divided in eight zones, and each zone had its own lab. And we provided them diagnostic assays of very reputable performance, no issues with diagnostics. And what you see here is, while well as one of the labs had 100% concordance with the results with the reference lab, so they accurately tested HBSAG positives as positives, negatives, and negatives. But the other seven labs, their concordance ranged from anywhere from 60% to as low as 20%. That means this one zone here, and this is a real world example where they were testing samples for, from blood donors, and they were testing them for only surface antigen, repeatedly reactive samples were considered negative, positive, and here in this instance, 80% of false negative, and these people were actually transfused with hepatitis B virus infected blood. And when I tested these samples here, 
90% of these HBS AG positive samples were also positive for HBV DNA with titers like in million international units. So you can imagine how, how these issues are impacting. So obviously here it's not the issue with the diagnostic tests because all, all sites had the same diagnostic kits and we had 100% concordance with one of the labs. Definitely an issue either with the infrastructure or with the personnel. Now, this, this slide here shows data from a single lab. It's done within a lab. So what we did here, we provided this lab uh, three samples, two positive for HBV markers, one sample negative for anti-HCV. Three technicians were involved with the testing. The samples were provided in, 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 with different IDs. Uh, the testers did not know that these are quality control samples. Uh, over a period of one month, this is what you see here. For hepatitis B, 50% of the times you had false results. For core, you had three times false results. And if you happen to give your sample on this particular day, you have a false positive. And when we did the analysis, what, because this is the same lab, they have the same equipment, same sample, nothing changed from lab to lab. So what our analysis showed is that all these false results were associated with one single person. So a single individual, whether he did anti-HCV uh, testing or, or Hep B testing had false results, clearly showing that Nothing wrong with the infrastructure, nothing wrong with the diagnostic test, it is the personnel competency. So, so how can we help in these settings to address all these issues? So, because this is a multi-pronged issue there. So, Dr. Ward has tasked us with this huge project, which is to develop these reference panels, which can actually address all these issues. I showed you that we provided short panels, like 10 to 15 samples, and clearly showed the issues in all those settings. So what we want to achieve here, the single main objective of developing these reference panels is to improve HCV and HPV diagnostics. And how do we do it? How these panels can help us? They can be used for the determination of the sensitivity and specificity of test kits worldwide. And this can permit local authorities to make informed decisions about the purchase of reliable and uh, reliable diagnostic kits. And I also believe that the data from the testing of such panels can be used by the local authorities in requesting additional resources for, for building capacity, for improving infrastructure, or for training their staff. So we want to start with, since this is the HCV meeting, so we want to start first with, with building or developing HCV reference panels. This is a multi-phase project. In the first phase of this project, uh, as is shown here on the slide, we want to source HCV positive plasma units from all countries with prevalence of different genotypes. As you can see here, uh, while as genotype one is the most prevalent genotype, so it's not so difficult to procure such plasma units, but there are challenges with, with other genotypes which are not as prevalent as genotype one. And this remains a, a major task here. So in the phase two of this project, uh, of course, involves the testing of these plasma units. The positive samples have to be retested by serology and by also for HCV RNA, and we plan to test them for all the available platforms here in the United States. We also plan to use the diagnostic assays that are most commonly used in those resource poor settings, just some of the major assays that are being used there. And we also want to, those that are NAT positive, we want to use the next generation sequencing approach. Yuri will talk about this tomorrow to generate a database of the sequences of locally circulating viral strains. And I've listed here that the negative plasma units have to be tested for all these markers that are here. And following this, the phase three is obviously the actual preparation and the distribution of these panels to different countries. So what are the challenges here? Of course, the first and foremost challenge is the funding. And I want to acknowledge the help of our CDC Foundation colleagues here who are helping us with, with uh, public-private partnership opportunities with different partners. 
Uh, this project is estimated at more than $2 million, as, as you can well imagine. And uh, the challenge that remain there is we need large volumes of HCV positive plasma units. We cannot do with one or two mils. We need you know, 500 ml to 800 ml of plasma units of all genotypes, of all subtypes. So that's, that's a major task. And uh, as was mentioned earlier by, by Claudia and Anna also, so various countries have different prevalence of false positivity. Uh, for example, we have seen in our own experience in, in African settings, you got large number of false positivities. Right? There's one paper that has uh, mentioned that it may be because of the schistosoma antibodies, like 25% cross-reactivity there. So that remains, uh, that remains a major challenge here to procure the negative plasma units. And of course, those of you who have worked in the international settings, there are, there are challenges there in getting permission from local authorities to export plasma units. So I think we, we need help from all of you in, in developing these panels. And of course, the issue of sustainability. Yes, we will develop the panels, we will provide the panels to these countries, but how do you, how do you uh, achieve the sustainability of good quality diagnostics? And that's where we want to train countries locally so that they can generate their own panels for their own QA and QC. And red light is flashing here. So uh, in summary, so what we want to achieve by, by developing these reference panels, I think in addition to evaluate the performance of the diagnostic assays, this will serve as an excellent repository of, of uh, samples for new assay validation. I mentioned earlier we want to generate a database of sequences that are of viral isolates that are circulating locally. Uh, Yuri will talk about this new technology, GHOST, that can be used in outbreak settings using these as reference sequences. And the single major objective here overall that we want to achieve is to improve the diagnostics of HCV and HV globally. Thank you all for your attention. Well, everybody who has um, spoken in this session, if you could come up to the uh, table, we can have a little bit of a um, round table discussion. Even though we have a rectangle table, we will be having a round table discussion. Because um, I think a lot of the um, questions really are relevant to multiple uh, presentations. I guess you can stay, sit here if you'd like. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, questions from the audience? Yes, over the microphone here on the right, please. Yes, uh, in regards to the user competency issues on the proficiency panel, what do you think was the biggest determining factor for that? Was it test complexity, training, background? What's the biggest challenge in? In, uh, in user competency, with the issues with that, was it the complexity of the test or the background of the technician or the training on the test? I think it's a, a multiple factors there. Uh, I've seen personally in, in several settings, you got an incubator that's supposed to incubate your plate at 37 degrees Celsius. So, and the display is 37, but when you stick in the thermometer there, it's 45. You're actually cooking the plate. Yeah. So you got all the, plate, all the samples on that plate are positive. And then I've also seen that the, the uh, plate readers and plate washers is easy, but plate readers, they're old, they're not calibrated, they don't have appropriate equipment. Uh, personally, I think in many, many of these places, it is the equipment that's, that's very old, that's not calibrated. You know, here in our lab, we calibrate our pipetters at regular intervals to see that they are dispensing the actual volumes. There, is, there are no such plans of calibration. So I think it's not just one factor, it's multiple factors. Thank you. Over here. So we had a quick question for you as well. The PT panels look awesome. I'm just sort of curious how you plan on reporting out those results given the importance of sort of not only having the results available to the person doing the PT panel, but also maybe to the broader community about sort of comparing performance. If you've put any thought into phase four of reporting the PT panel results. So reporting back to where the units came from or? No, to the people who are participating in the PT program theoretically in the future? So if I understand your question, so the, all the units, uh, the sa samples that we will get here, they'll be de-identified? So nope. So country X lab Y chooses to participate and they request the PT panel, they do the testing, they send back the results. 
Is that then sort of a web-based thing so they can look at their results as compared to someone else's or just what are your thoughts on sort of that piece, I guess? Uh, we really have not gone that far yet, and I still do not have any plasma unit in, in my inventory, but what we plan to do is to create a web-based online system where if we get 10 units from a certain country, so that they can have real-time access to the results, that, that, you know, and they can match their results with our results. So, so there is no time lag in between. Mm -hmm. That's Do how we foresee it. Thank you, Salim. Dr. Engel, Jeff? I'd like to, to thank all the speakers for a wonderful afternoon session. Thank you um, for all your talks. I'm in, uh, in the global resource poor countries, so I'm looking mainly at WHO and Médecins Sans Frontiers. Um, are there any uh, lessons learned from the experience with delivering HIV care to these resource poor countries that we can learn to apply to hepatitis C? Thinking that a lot of the laboratory methodologies are the same, uh, uh, even the medications are the same uh, in that you have to monitor you know, viral loads or molecular testing along the way. And we've been successful in very resource poor uh, areas in treating HIV. So are there any lessons learned to, we can use to move to hepatitis C? Um, yes, I think that we have learned a lot with uh, HIV uh, activities and with uh, really all the 20 past years uh, taking care and trying to cope with this HIV epidemic. Um, so in terms of tests, in, ter in terms of human resources, and in terms also of guidelines, uh, what is needed on the field, we, we really um, learned a lot. We learn also that there are not one strategy that is uh, um, that should be applied everywhere, but that the strategy should be adapted to the context. So, for example, point of care in some settings, um, more DBS with uh, uh, central laboratories in uh, in other settings. So, we there there is really a parallel between the two diseases. After, I think that we should take care also not to push and to really remind that hepatitis C could be cured in 12 weeks. And so this is really a big, uh, big difference, and it should uh, push the, um, the Ministry of Health and the countries to take over and <coughs> to, to approach differently the disease. So. Yeah. I agree with all of that as well. And I, I think, you know, learning such as like task shifting from, from HIV, we need to apply in hepatitis to stem this epidemic. And I think we can in countries, and that's also the plan for, for, for find to kind of create like an entry, um, use the HIV infrastructure. And as you say, use like the, the same platforms. Um, what we have currently, so the polyvalency of those platforms um, to um, to use utilize access capacity if it's there, um, and the same like providers. Obviously, we have to do this very very carefully because obviously, in countries where there is uh, HIV large <coughs> HIV issues, we wouldn't want to encroach upon that. Uh, so it has to be really thought through, but. Um, but I think there are lots of learnings that can be taken and implemented and lots of infrastructure that also can be utilized and kind of used to create an entry. Absolutely, we shouldn't forget about the mono-infected. So I think it's an entry into a hepa building hepatitis C capacity um, from which we can start but then uh, implement also for mono-infected. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I uh, quickly, so I'm a member of the AIDS clinical trial group Virology uh, Quality Assurance Working Group for the past 12, 13 years. It's been in the making for all this year. And I agree what you say. So now we have Zimbabwe, Botswana, Uganda, China. They are all part of our working group. So there are about two dozen United States lab, like myself. And then there's a lot of volunteers because this is supported by NIH. So what we did was we started very small and then we approach like Kampala in Zimbabwe, and then we actually send people like Hopkins, the Case Western Reserve, they will go there briefly. They make a connection. So we started only with five, six places, 
And then I remember they used the FedEx sample to me. I'll do an email to them. Now they are totally proficient. By, so it takes many years, but if you can follow the uh, AIDS clinical trial group, it's very good because uh, as the ACTG, we just started HCV quality assurance about January 2016. So now they, they get big source, I want to use the word buckets, but of HCV sample. They, they have a contract by NIH. You know, NIH, CDC, I think you're all government agency. They actually making panels. They also making dry blood spa, making panel. They do the FedEx. It's all covered. And uh, I'm thinking if they're going to send it anyway, probably does not make it di different how much you send. If I can give you the contact, this the group of 10 people, they are headquartered in Chicago. That's the Virology Quality Assurance Working Group for HIV just started doing HCV. I think I see maybe put these two together. Well, they also work with doctor with no board, a few of them. So I think this way it can put you together. It may be very helpful because they just started. Thank you. Microphone here, please. A uh, question for Salim. I, I just wanted to share briefly an experience we had in South Africa with HIV testing, which would translate to the H. CV in that uh, we went on a number of site visits and the quality issues you described, absolutely prevalent, the quality of the water, the lack of Q QC, et cetera, was impacting results. But what we also found was they weren't remotely following the manufacturer's IFUs. So I just wonder you know, if your study is going to include automated platforms from you know, those of us that offer that, if you're going to require that they follow the procedure before they report out a result instead of simply doing like a one-off. Yeah, obviously, um, if, if there's an automated platform, so uh, you, you're required to follow the manufacturer's instructions. The issues of uh, false positivity with, with especially anti-HCV testing in Africa, I think that is, that's independent of any testing platform. So I had samples from one of the countries where 100 samples that were anti-HCV screening reactive on any platform, ortho, abbott, none of them could be REBA confirmed, and HCV RNA was not detectable in any of them. So they were locally positive, and they were also positive in the reference testing. So it was nothing to do with the performance of the, or the, you know, the personnel or the infrastructure. So uh, I think what we have seen is, in some places, they're cutting corners if the kit expires. It's an expensive kits, and you tend to use it still or sometimes you run, run out of controls from the kids, and then they use their own controls. And I think that's also creating a challenge in appropriate use of those kids. So I think whether the manufacturers can put like, you know, stickers outside the kit, do not use your own controls, or you, know, you cannot rely on these testing uh, if you modify the kit in any shape or form. So. And maybe just to add Wait, to just, this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think proficiency testing is obviously uh, extremely important. Um, what we are trying to do also is to utilize uh, connectivity solutions to um, to monitor both device and perf and tester performance. Uh, that obviously applies largely to like on the platforms uh, for for RNA or antigen testing. Um, but I think that is another kind of piece of the puzzle that could help to to monitor um, the, the performance. But obviously for lateral flow assays there, you would have to have a reader to enable a connectivity solution, then there's added cost to that. But there, I think also if we can learn from HIV um, and make sure that the, the constant training, uh, especially as the staff turnover is often very rapid, is maintained at sites so that um, quality is maintained. I had a question for uh, Cami. Um, you really spoke about a very important concept, at least for me, which is just how do you get the right testing done for the right purpose, and where you're not give, having a test that's um, you know overly complicated or really almost um, the precision is is more um, rigorous than is needed for the particular task at hand, and as a result, you make the barrier very high to get access to that type of testing. So I was just curious if you just could maybe spend a little few more minutes about what kind of um, 
studies do you think we need to do to try to make that case uh, more persuasively that um, we can have tests that maybe aren't as precise as those, um, those, those um, levels of precision that were shown in the last presentation? Any thoughts about the kind of studies needed? Yeah, you know, I think part of it is just getting kind of the academic community globally to accept that just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do it um, if it compromises overall access because most people can't afford, you know, a more complex and, and more expensive, you know, regimen. So, um, you know, I think um, HIV Forum put together um, uh, uh, find helped with this, uh, uh, a conversation a couple of years ago, you know, getting folks around the world to accept that, you know, for most medical management scenarios in hepatitis C, a thousand international units was an okay sensitivity, um, even though we tend to want to see less than 15. Um, we're not actually doing anything with that information much of the time. And so, you know, first of all, it's kind of getting everybody on board. And then I think what we need to have in, in, in and this has been true even in the United States where we have, you know, great clinical trials and all of this, you know, when we have registries like TRIO or like Target where we see what actually happens in the real world, you know, a couple of those patients I showed up there, they're the, 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 the number of people represented in clinical trials like those patients is zero. Like, we have no data on how to actually treat those patients. And we're just going in there and doing the best we can. If you're doing a countrywide program, you know, figuring out what's that sort of minimal data that you need to generate in order to be able to collect it real time. We also tend to create very complicated data collection thing, you know, and then you find out a year later you actually had a real problem, you know, in, in, in implementation. You know, what's that streamlined data collection that can allow allow you to course correct, this actually is not performing in the real world, you know, whether it's your antibody test or, you know, we're going to be looking at three different ways to check viral load in Pakistan, using Cepheid, using, you know, a Roche Cobus and then in dried blood spots and just kind of comparing them and seeing how they perform. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, how would the CDC help with that? I think these standardized panels will be amazing, you know, in then providing technical assistance, you know, to some of these big pilot programs, you know, here are the data we found are really important, you know, to check during these time intervals. Um, and if you don't gather this information now, it's really hard to go back. You'll suffer in the future, you know, put in a little bit of extra time now. It, you know, just figuring out every, for every single step, you know, every penny you spend when you start magnifying it across a million people is a lot of money, you know, but sometimes a little bit of extra effort and money up front, you know, really saves you heartache in the, in the future. So, um, you know, I think this is where, you know, our diagnostics companies and, you know, and then you guys find, you know, the academic folks, you know, that's, that, that's why that partnership is important. May I actually add to this? So what Kemi was referring to was uh, both the TPP process and the values and preferences survey that we did about a year ago um, and that will be com coming out in a publication hopefully in the next months. But what we did concretely is we used the WHO um, network um, and also the HIV forums network and asked people, so if you had like a test that uh, can be done on capillary blood, would uh, you be okay with that test being 95% sensitive? And then you get these kind of values and preferences and the trade-offs that people are willing to accept. And there we really also try to ask people who are in, uh, in the low- and middle-income countries. And I think that is one piece of the puzzle. And then utilizing the data and really plugging it into like cost-effectiveness models and, and transmission models, I think is really useful. If you can show that with a test you can actually access more people, the incremental benefit that outweighs uh, the, the trade-off of the decreased sensitivity, that is something that a modeling study can show very well. So I think that is the data that needs to come from the academia in this room and, and, and yeah. yeah. I have one follow-up question maybe for both Claudia and um, for Cami and maybe others. It's just um, I um, always struggle with the right balance of uh, attention and priorities between point of care assay development implementation and more clinic based because um, uh, point of care you, you just don't get the volume that you could by using large laboratories that can process many specimens at the same time and um, 
And then I look at the epidemiology in a, in a number of the countries with high prevalence of hepatitis C or tend to be more middle-income countries than low-income countries. And so the, la the, the laboratory capacity is a little bit stronger than in some low-income settings. And so just wanted to, if you had, and then if you look, you saw the trends in Georgia where you have one out of every five men in their 40s is HCV antibody positive. And so you're really gonna have to do high volume testing to do that. So I just wanted to see if y'all had any thoughts about how do you strike that balance between striving to strengthen and improve lab-based test systems versus uh, focused on clinic point of care tests. Any, any thoughts on that? I'd appreciate. So I think actually Anne made a comment to that effect earlier already. Um, I think there is a balance. I think there is no point of care solution for one country and like centralized solution for the other. I think it's actually in every country you kind of need to figure out with the national programs like what fits best where. Um, and obviously there are countries that have a more uh, have a good uh, centralized laboratory system and also the logistics uh, to refer samples. And uh, with DBS, I think we can also uh, ease kind of the the, uh, the burden on the on the transport mechanisms. And I think, for example, in Georgia, it's actually an excellent example because I think it actually has um, relatively good centralized laboratory systems, particularly around Tbilisi. Um, but um, then also you have these peripheral sites, and for example, there there are many um, drug users who would not give blood if they knew that the sample would actually be sent to somewhere that could be at all associated with the government. Because unfortunately, there is still um, uh, punishment associated with drug use. And there, you know, you might actually capture a larger amount of patients if you do the point of care testing. So I think it's both, um, you know, patient preference, access, ability to refer samples and it's but it's a, you have to strike a balance and I think ultimately I mean centralized testing will always be cheaper uh, because if you can you can have the throughput um, but you will have to have some settings uh, where you where you prefer the point of care testing and may that be because of the lack of infrastructure or because of patient preference <laughs> Oh, for me, just uh, um, uh, it's linked also with the acceptability for patients, but uh, the retention of care is very important in, in this type of decision, and uh, it's true that uh, with uh, immediate result uh, with point of care, it's really, yeah, you create a different contact and you with the patients and yeah, a different answer. I really like the idea of having a multiplexed panel for the different forms of hepatitis A, B, C, D, E. And also, uh, I'm asking about how you vision the production of this panel. It will be something like cap format, dried uh, powder to be easy to send anywhere, or it will be, you know, such kind of liquid, you know, or uh, whole blood or plasma or whatever, this is one thing. The second thing, the sustainability. Assuming that we have several countries will be interested to join this program. Uh, what kind of sustainability you are thinking just to have successful program uh, going on the ground? Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. So, to, to, to the first question, how do we plan to uh, provide these panels in what format? So, so we all know that the dry ice shipments to any country outside the United States is like a $2,000 shipment. So that adds a significant cost to this effort. So what we are currently trying to do, Amanda Po is here and Maya Kodani is here, so what they're working together now is find out if we can dry the plasma samples in a tube, which is called DTS, dried tube samples, uh, we got preliminary results that, that these samples, DTS, can remain stable at, at 37 degrees for about three to six months without losing sensitivity. The challenge there is that it is difficult to lyophilize large volumes of samples. This is only true if you have like 100 microliters of sample. 
So this is an effort that we are currently working on, so whether we can cut down on the cost of shipping samples as is, like on dryer shipments, which is expensive, can we switch to these alternate methodologies? Uh, about sustainability, and we have already done, to some extent, uh, this, this, address this issue, which is all labs, small or big, anywhere, they receive samples that are confirmed positive, that are confirmed negative. So if you train these individual labs to save those samples, and sometimes they have large volumes of the same samples, or blood banks, which test a blood unit that is negative, positive for anti-HCV or HBSAG, they just discard it. Right there, you can make 800, 500 allocards of that sample after you have confirmed it's positive, and a lab manager or a quality manager in those settings can create locally panels from these positive, negative samples. That's what we mean by creating sustainability so that they do not always rely on these outside panels because it's not going to be cost effective uh, for long, on long term basis. Um, Chris. So my memory is failing me, but there's a company that makes these little cigarette butt things that you put the, your blood in and it dries and then you ship it and then you can reconstitute the sample later. Um, it's actually a small company from right around here. Um, sample tanker, thank you, there we go, there we go. So maybe that's something to look at. We actually played with it years ago and it actually worked quite well. And it, uh, the company now that bought the rights to that is called Vive or V-I-V-E. -V -V um, but that's not my question. I guess my question is, is more to maybe Claudia and Cami. But um, so in the last couple of years, there have been some interesting papers um, related to um, printing oligonucleotides to capture um, various um, sequences and sequence them um, related to the genomics effort in large part and looking at large panels. But it's been adapted to look at, at viruses. And there's a outfit at Wash University and another one at Cornell they're called ViroCapSeq, or I mean, they all have a very similar name. I guess the question is, is, and and maybe to, to to John's um point um and and a central lab solution. Are, is anybody going to be looking at those types of of assays, not just to look at um the diversity of HCV, which is a challenge, um but also to look at you know other viruses. You could basically get the whole viral profile. In a single um, in a single um, assay, and then you would be, be able to you know kind of spread the cost across different um, disease areas. So, so uh, tomorrow in in the I think in the first session there is a presentation by Tanya Applegate, and uh, Tanya Applegate. No, it's Christian Hinoshi. She's here. She's here. She's right there. So she will be talking about uh, an integrated multiplex approach where she will talk about where in, in the, from the same sample, you can generate sequences of up to 70 different uh, viral genomes in the same sample. So I, I look forward to listening to that presentation. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Well, great. Thank you all for a fantastic session. Okay. The, the day we went over um, quite a lot, both uh, domestically and globally. I think we covered a lot of uh, ground around um, the needs of um, simplifying uh, testing uh, while also assuring its quality so that we can reach the populations we had in need. We had excellent examples of that um, early today. Uh, uh, from the uh, from, uh, from um, various clinical perspectives of how we can decrease the number of tests being required and also how do you make that available so it's as easy to order uh, as possible for the clinician. Um, we uh, also heard from commercial laboratories um, and really, at least in the United States, really demonstrated once again the power of public-private partnerships in, in helping to spread the word regarding the importance of testing, promoting different tools to, uh, to promote implementation of effective testing, such as reflex testing, and then sharing data that helps public health evaluate um, the implementation uh, of those um, uh, policies. And then here, uh, globally, we had an excellent 
example throughout the day of the you know, really profound um, needs that we are going to have to work on together to improve testing um, around the world. So we, we covered a lot of uh, ground that I think will be helpful for us all um, going forward. Um, if there are no uh, any late breaking comments, uh, I'll adjourn the meeting. I encourage everyone to have a, have a uh, good evening. There's a great uh, bar at the you know, Emory Conference Center Hotel. I'm thinking about going there later. I you know, hope to see some of you there. Um, no, um, and um, hope to have everybody back here at 8 o'clock sharp tomorrow so that we can be begin on time. Thank you all, and have a good evening.